But we will come back to our main topic now, Rob, and that is special effects that you would change. Mm. So, as, as I said at the start of the show, we, we're not having a go at Doctor Who special effects. We're not saying we don't watch them because of all the special effects. We're going to mention some stories here that I think perhaps we're quite fond of and we know others are certainly fond of, but occasionally there is that special effect or that production value in Doctor Who where you go, that's really let the side down. And and, and and because the show perhaps hinges off it or perhaps because of the way that it affects a show or the role it plays in the story, it does actually bring the story down. And you do sort of wish that they could have done it with a, with a modern budget. And they're the ones that we're kind of having a look at here. Not to kick them, just to say, would these be better regarded if they'd had modern production values, modern special effects? Yeah, and there's going to be a lot of personal opinion in this, day because Ooh, I, yes. I, I went through the list and I'd look at many stories and think, oh, well, there's effects there that, oh, well, absolutely, you could change, but would I want to change them? And for some stories, I think the effects are quite charming and of their time, and I actually like them, and yes. I wouldn't change them at all, even though objectively you can look at it and say, that's a terrible effect, or well, that looks horrible. Yes, Absolutely. Uh, so at the end, I don't know about you, Dave, but I've got a few episodes I wouldn't touch that I'm going to raise and, and mention those briefly as well. Absolutely. So look, let's kick on. Um, we didn't set ourselves a particular number, but genuinely, coincidentally, we've both come up with six each mm-hmm. and we've put them into chronological order. I know what seasons you've picked, Rob. You know what seasons I've picked, but we don't know the stories. No. But we do know that I am kicking us off with a story from season two, and that is The Web Planet. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Now, here, I'm not looking at a lot of it, but I think the Web Planet holds together very well. It, it is a bit slow. It's of its time, but it is wonderfully creative, wonderfully inventive. The way they try and create monoptral culture and, and the Planet of Waters is really good. But the big conclusion, the big climax, is the final confrontation with the TARDIS crew and the Animus. Mm-hmm. And the Animus is embarrassingly bad. It's just this sort of giant spidery thing, <laughs> clearly just sort of tied to the studio roof, occasionally bouncing up and down when somebody sort of gives it a nudge off screen. And and for it to be the big bad of a six-week epic that's that's been so engaging and so interesting and just falls and looks so terrible, you know, you get that stuff where Barbara is sort of rolling around on the floor... <laughs> <laughs> trying to point the isotope at it, and it's and it's just sort of sitting there bouncing, and it's yes, it, it's a shame. And I, I think I don't want to redo all the special effects in the Web Planet, but I think if the Animorphs looked better, that would be a far more exciting conclusion. If the Animorphs yeah. was more like, say, the, uh, the 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 CGI Sarlacc in the remade uh, Return of the Jedi. Ooh, yeah. You know, with with tentacles that actually move and, and some, some sort of threat, you know, that could actually be a really exciting conclusion that I think would add a lot to the story. So don't want to remake all of the web planet, but I want a better Animus at the end of the web planet. Mm. All right. So on to season seven. And this is obviously one of your favorite seasons, Dave. So yeah. I'm wondering if you're already guessing what I might have picked. I have a suspicion, and I'm going to be curious to hear it. So go on, Rob. Slay, slay the sacred cow in front of me. Doctor Who and the Silurians. Okay, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> There's a few things I'd change here, Dave. Uh, firstly, I'd change the Silurian costumes. I'd still have the same style, but I think they can look a lot more lifelike. I, th- I think that's fair to say, rather than just rubbery suits. I, I'm not saying go to the extremes of what they look like in New Who with the uh, the human faces and then they put on the, the the reptile mask to look like reptiles. I'm saying keep it pretty much like it, like it was, but change that for sure. Uh, the scenes down in the caves, I think, could be done a lot better, a lot more expansively, a lot more scarily. And, and vitally, at the end, Dave, the explosion where the brigadier kills them. Mm. It's just it's just this like in the background and it's like <laughs> that's it. Okay, maybe I can imagine more happened underground, but I really would have liked to have seen some big bloody explosion. Uh just horrifying. They're the things I would touch up in that story because the reason I would do it is because it's a brilliant story and to me it's let down by those issues. Interesting. It's certainly not one that I would pick, and I'm sure you, you realise that. Yes. If there's anything in that story I'll change, it would be the dinosaur. Okay. Yeah, you, look, 
you're, you're, you're right. I wouldn't change the Solarian costumes, but could they be a little bit more naturalistic? Could the mouths look a little bit better? Yeah. Uh, could, could the head not obviously be sort of shaking when the battery goes off in the third eye? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. I see where you're coming from. Yeah, and, and, and in some areas, these are not so much special effects, but practical effects, but they're still effects. No, no, fair enough. Uh, so that was the first of three Pertwees that we're covering, and the second is one of mine. Mm-hmm. Now, picture this, Rob. Yes. We have a story. We have unit. Yes. We have the master. Yes. The master's got a plan. It's it's interesting. It involves time. It's, mm. it's something different. <laughs> we have an evil from the dawn of time, an all-powerful figure that even the doctor is afraid of. The yeah. master's summoning it. It comes towards us. And it's a guy in a rubber suit flapping his turkey wings really, really violently. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about, Rob? It's the demons. No. <laughs> it's the time monster. It's the time monster. I'm talking Kronos from the time monster. I think the time monster gets a lot of bad publicity that isn't entirely deserved. I think the first two episodes on Earth are the weakest. The middle two, with all the stuff with the Doctor and the Master and the Tardises, is kind of cool. And the last two in Atlantis are really cool. Um, I love what they do in Atlantis. I love Dalios as a character. I love the destruction of Atlantis. But the whole thing hinges on Kronos the Cronivore being this big, evil, dangerous, mm. malevolent, powerful thing that even the Doctor is terrified of and that the Master's terrified of and the Master's really going right out there on the edge of sanity by trying to control this beast, mm. this, this creature. And they do a lot of stuff where they just have that flapping sound and a lot of light off screen and and all the rest of it but there are moments when it is just a guy with a ridiculous helmet costume some (laughs) fake wings desperately flapping about he's clearly got legs and and the legs just look so stupid on something that's meant to be like sort of bird like it's 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 really really bad not so bad in the bit where they could do the destruction of Atlantis because at least then he's flying around on the Kirby wires and you've got all the other stuff going on. But yeah, I think if Kronos looked the way that it was built up to look, yeah, this would be a better story and a better regarded story. Oh, look, I completely agree because it seems every episode of this podcast, or at least every second episode of this podcast, I end up saying, I read the target book first, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> yes. And in this case, I did read the Target book first. I, I know this episode was kicking around with my local club president, but for some reason I hadn't seen it on television. I hadn't seen his VHS copy of it. And the Target novel came out in the late 80s, and I read it and thought this this story was just fantastic. I thought it was a, a fantastic story, amazing. And then I saw it, and I thought, okay, that's not quite as good. <laughs> and, I, and I retreated back to the book. Yeah. But that, but that is proof positive that the story itself is really good. Mm. And it is, and it is let down by things like that effect. Yeah, I, I think so. So yeah, I want to redo Kronos. Okay, another Pertwee season eleven, and I'm guessing you can guess this one too, Dave. Because I have so a obvious suspicion. Yes. All right, I'll I'll pull the bandaid off. It's Invasion of the Dinosaurs. Okay. And what would I change? I change the dinosaurs. Obviously, the the story is brilliant. Again, it, it's like uh, the Time Monster. It, it, it's a fantastic story, but. The, the the dinosaurs just let it down. I know, I know for the time it was great and so on, but it, it is the one thing that people will raise whenever you bring this story up, whether it's with a, a fan locally, a fan, you know, in the middle of the USA, a fan anywhere on Earth. Mm. <laughs> All fans will say, that's a good story, but... dot dot dot, And they bring up the dinosaurs. It's, it's the obvious thing to change. It's the only flaw in the whole damn thing. Which is disappointing, you know, because it is such a great story. Oh, my God, Dave. It, it is a fantastic story. And as one of the founding members of the Invasion of the Dinosaurs fan club, I, I'm <laughs> you know, definitely out there, a card-carrying member. Even if you just change the Tyrannosaurus, you know, the, the others I don't think are too bad. And that's partly because, well, the Pterodactyl as well. But the Stegosaurus mm. and the Brontosaurus and the Triceratops, they kind of just have to stand there in a model and look okay. And, and they kind of do that. Whereas the Tyrannosaurus actually has to act, so to speak. It actually has to menace at particular times and do stuff. And the other thing is, you know, research into the dinosaurs was still, you know, far, far less advanced 45 years ago now than it is today. And and Mm. remember when they were making Jurassic Park, 
And there was all that new research just coming out about how the Tyrannosaurus Rex actually would have stood and how it would have moved. Yeah. And, and that it would have been that much more sort of forward-leaning and agile on its feet sort of thing. But what they did in Invasion of the Dinosaurs, if you look at any storybook or book about dinosaurs made that time, that time or prior, they all had the Tyrannosaurus Rex as they sort of leaning back, standing upright sort of squat creature. Mm, mm. Um Almost Godzilla-like. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. And, and and so we just didn't have any really knowledge of how to do it. And so yeah, I think you would approach the Tyrannosaurus in a completely different way now. You wouldn't just take what it is and, and, and make it look better. You would just change the whole concept of it. So mm. it could be really interesting to do. But you, you would have to change the story. I mean, you couldn't imagine a Jurassic Park-style Tyrannosaurus just standing there for five minutes whilst the action sort of happened around it and it just sort of roared, which is kind of what we thought dinosaurs did. But we now know the Tyrannosaurus leaned forward and was agile and could run. And and so, you know, you'd have to change the story to, to suit that. That's a really interesting idea. I'm just going to throw this out there because I, I've got the visual in my head at the moment. Could you imagine the Jodie Whittaker Doctor? Imagine Invasion of the Dinosaurs never happened in the Pertwee era and the Jodie Whittaker Doctor appears in this next series in Invasion of the Dinosaurs and we have modern dinosaurs running around a deserted London. Maybe we have, I don't know which of the companions would end up on the uh, pretend spaceship. Uh, let's say Yaz. You can give Yaz something to do. Yeah, that would be very cool, actually. Yeah, just imagine the current TARDIS team with special effects in that same story, and I think, wow, people would think that is amazing. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And just I mean, a- the same applies to all the New Who Doctors as well, but Jodie is our current Doctor. She had a bit of a duff season, you know, last season, and I just think, put her in something like this. Wouldn't wouldn't it be incredible? Let's go even further. I'm imagining Graham still getting over the death of his wife, looking for meaning in his life, and being one of the people recruited into Operation Golden Age. Yes. Yeah. Oh, wouldn't that be good? That would be very good. Good and call. And the dinosaurs would appeal to kids. Uh, it all fits. It all yep. comes together. It would appeal to older fans, younger fans, everybody. Oh. No, Why look- aren't we writing the show, Dave? <laughs> No, look, that that started as an obvious one, Rob. But yeah, you've, you've gone into a really interesting place, so I like that. But uh, the mm. next one is yours as well, and we're now into the Tom era. Yeah, we're into the Tom era. And this is probably my most... Oh, this is this is probably my most stretching sort of one. It, but it just... I was looking at names, I was thinking about effects and stories, and I thought, yeah, I would change that. There, there are many, many, many ones that I wouldn't. But for some reason, this one just stuck out to me. And it's the Invasion of Time. Interesting. I thought it was going to be something else when I saw what season it was from, but no, no, you've surprised me. So keep going. No, there are two things that have always bugged me in this in this story, and it's the way the Vardens look when they're sort of energy right. beings, you know, when they're that crappy sort of energy effect. I think a modern effect, a modern shimmery energy being could look very, very cool, you know, in a story like this. Amazing, even. And the second thing is uh, the interior of the TARDIS, where they just went and filmed it in an old hospital. I used to get just so irate as a kid, like, this this looks nothing like the, the, the TARDIS. <laughs> they're, they're just in some building. What is this? I understand the TARDIS can probably look like whatever it wants to look like, but there was just no cues to it being the TARDIS to me, you know. Tweak those two things, and this story would be even better than it is. You started this segment, Rob, by saying that this is all a matter of opinion. Yes. And I totally disagree with you on this one, I've got to say. (laughs) Nothing you've said ever really stood out to me as a problem. Really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, gosh, the the interior of the TARDIS in particular always bugged me as a kid. I, I get why it would, but I just never cared. That's okay. Like I said, this is this is my one of my six yeah, that yeah, is yeah. the most reaching, weird sort of one. Oh, well, but I would well, still no. do it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and we were certainly going to have some divergent opinions across the way. And this, this could be the one where we diverge the most. Mm. And if you were redoing the special effects or the production values on the Invasion of Time, would you completely change the TARDIS interior and make it very conventional TARDISy, 
or would you sort of take what they're going for, these sort of different spaces and these different ideas, but just every so often have a few randles and every so often yes. have a few things just to just to remind you you're inside it. Is that what you're saying? Yes, because back in uh, the mid-80s, I think around 86, there was a, a strip in Doctor Who Monthly and there were some episodes where the Doctor was walking... Episodes, here we go. <laughs> there were some issues <laughs> where the Doctor was walking around the TARDIS with Frobisher and you sort of got glimpses into other parts of the TARDIS and you would see a room where Bessie was parked in a room and you'd see another room where there was a couple of these old coats up on mannequins. And I, I used to just reread those pages because I used to just love seeing inside the TARDIS and seeing all these different things. So, yes, I, I fully believe you can have different things. The much talked about TARDIS pool, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but just some sort of sense, at least in that era where the TARDIS did have a particular look on the inside, just as you say, some roundels here and there, some panels just something that, that just pushes it more towards yes we're still in the TARDIS it's 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 different we know but it's still the TARDIS not just I'm running down a deserted hospital corridor okay I could get behind that hmm. as I say it's my weird one no no, no I, I, I get what you're saying it, it wouldn't be my pick and it, well, it wasn't one of my picks but I, <laughs> I get what you're saying Alrighty. so the next one is one of mine and I'm going to say this at the start if the pitch to the writer is Robert, write us a story with the biggest Doctor Who monster ever. Mm. You kind of want that monster to actually work if you're hinging the whole concept off it. And in The Power of Kroll, <laughs> it doesn't. Now, let me be very specific here. I think that the model of Kroll actually isn't too bad for mm. 1978 or whatever it was. Yeah. But the way that it interacts with the other models, the way that it interacts with the filmed location work, the way that it's um, patched in and all, all the rest of it completely fails to sell the idea that this model is in the same place as everything else that is going on. It, it just completely does not look realistic. And it could have been just... It's just so close to being correct and it just doesn't quite work. So the scenes where it's attacking the swampy village and they've clearly just locked off the top half of the camera for the model shot and there's a, and there's one straight flat line and the same when it's on the horizon then yeah. when Kroll goes to attack the refinery the refinery model looks nice the Kroll model looks nice but the two are completely mismatched and it actually just ends up looking like a puppet attacking a small refinery model in a, in a, in a pool or in a bath mm. Mm. Um, it, it's, it's that last 10% that doesn't quite work and I think that if you're going to call the story The Power of Kroll, you're going to write a story that's all about this great big huge octopus monster thing, mm. that's got to work, and it doesn't quite, and I think The Power of Kroll would be better regarded if Kroll did work. I, I think the Swampies could also do with a little bit of extra care and love, particularly the Whigs, but that's a quite an interesting story. It's quite a moral story. There's, it's got interesting Robert Holmes characters. It's got a bit of wit. Uh, Tom Baker plays it well. It's It's got Philip Maddock. Mm. It's but, got great location shooting. I love yeah. out there on the marshes. I yeah. think that looks fantastic. Yeah, it does. It, it's just that the crawl model doesn't work, and I think that's a problem, and I would like to redo the crawl model. Okay. I, I certainly considered this story. I think the fact that it does work to a degree, as you say, it's the last 10% that's not working, is why I gave it a pass and didn't tip it onto my list. I did consider it, though. So we're, we're pretty close on this one, Dave. I, th I, I agree an updated crawl could, could sell that story a little better, for sure. Fair enough. We are continuing with the Tom Baker era <laughs> with another of yours. I have genuinely no idea what this one is. I know... It's from season 18. I, I don't know where you're going, so tell me. Oh, come on, Dave. There's a season 18 story that is so effects heavy. It's very effects heavy. I can... Oh, no, just tell me. Warrior's Gate. Okay. Now, the whole thing, Dave, is just so trippy. You know, for the time, the things they're doing on the video... They're very cheesy, but they're very cool. I get it. You know, I can watch it now and go, oh, this is just weird and trippy and, you know, very, very 70s. But I just like it to look a bit better. You know, the same idea is just better realised. You know, whether it's walking around in that in that white void, whether mm. it's walking around those strange gardens. I'd actually like it to look like they're walking around the garden rather than just an image of the garden. You know, that has its own charm, though. You, you know, it, it does work to some degree. 
Uh, you say Power of Kroll was the last 10% that needed doing it. Here, it's maybe the last 20% that yeah. just doesn't quite work for me because it is a weird thing that they're trying to show. So it looks weird, and that's cool. It fits, but, oh, man, that story, I think, could just be tipped into greatness if it just had slightly better effects for what it's about. I, I also think, like Power of Kroll the bigger problem in Warrior's Gate is the interaction between the effects. So the privateer spaceship is a good model. It looks okay. The 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 gateway is a great model. That looks good. TARDIS, yes. etc. But when you get to the end and you've got that one shot that's got all the models sort of all together, clearly on a studio white background, all together it just doesn't work. Hmm. And, exactly. and, and you're right, all the pieces here I think do work really well and really nicely, but sometimes the bringing them together, they don't all work together. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's disappointing because it is such a different story too for Doctor Who. Like, I can't think of anything like it in that, in that season or in, in most of Doctor Who, really. No, and look, when you told me that one of your picks was from season 18, I did wonder if you were going to redo The Great One from State of Decay. Ah, but I'm glad you didn't, because I kind of like it. <laughs> Very good. Uh, into Davo. Um, I'm the only one who's picked a Davo story. Yeah, I had an embargo around Davo, because all of Davo is perfect, Dave. You should know this. <laughs> uh, I would like to redo, with completely new production values from top to bottom, special effects, monster costume, sets, uh, video effects work, the lot. I want to redo Terminus. Okay, fair call. Fair call. There are some fantastic concepts in Terminus. Some some great concepts in Terminus. But it looks drab and cheap. You have these great engines that they're going to explode and destroy the universe and there's sort of a couple of metres square sitting <laughs> at the back of a studio. The GARM, I don't know what they're trying to do, but the, the, the fact that you can clearly see the cloth inside his mouth and, yeah. the, and, and the light bulb eyes, no... It should, it should never have been seen. It should just have been in shadow if that was what they were going to do. Uh, the models are dull. The sets are dull. That that skull motif in the first episode is kind of cool, but the costumes are silly. But yeah, the, the, it just doesn't match the greatness and the grandeur of the story. And that's a great shame. And I would like to see a completely remade with new production values Terminus. I think that would be a far more interesting and watched and, and regarded story. You know, you're, you're talking about a remade Terminus there. And, and look, I, I concur with all those points. And I was talking about a remade Invasion of the Dinosaurs. I think where are these writers? Where are the writers with this sort of imagination writing for the current series? <laughs> You know, I don't mean to be rude to the current writers, but you look at the imagination and the things that are going on in a story like Terminus, and you think, gosh, what if what if that was being handed in as a script today? Wouldn't that be a fantastic episode? Mm. I, I can't see it any other way, you know. Um, but yeah, look, completely, completely agree. The garm, uh, the the armor those guys are wearing, it's an interesting design, but it doesn't quite look right as armor. Um, yeah, and for, and for Nissa's farewell story too, it would have been great if this was just a, a cracking-looking story. Yeah, I actually think the script works. I think the script is really good. Oh, it, it does, absolutely. But it it is one story where the visual effects are just so drab and just completely fail to deliver the grandeur, and, and that is a shame. Yeah, absolutely. So that was our one Davo. You're going to take us through with our one Colin and our one McCoy. Yes, isn't this interesting? Mm. Because uh, I've got to say, I'm I'm not looking at any new Who stories in this list, Dave. No, but I've got two, so you're going to take mm. us to the end of the classic era. I am. So let's kick off with season 22 and the story, which you could guess, oh, I don't know, there's maybe a few. <laughs> Time Lash, Dave. Yeah, <laughs> look, I think lash. that's the obvious pick. So how, how would you do it? Where would you focus? Oh, look, the, the, the sets overall could do without looking like well, 1980s sets, but it's, it's the time lash itself. I think that could be amazingly scary. Instead, it's very panto from the outside. Yeah. Like like people going up to it and sort of, whoop, and <laughs> dropping through. It's like something you would see on a panto stage, you know, just a really crap on stage panto effect. It's terrible. Uh, and of course, the inside of it is a joke too. Just those things sticking out of the walls and the 
is it sparkly? I think it's sparkly inside. It's tinselly. It? It's tinselly. Yeah, God, yuck. Um, <laughs> and yet it could be this... Re- Imagine if it was this swirling, horrible maelstrom with screams coming out of it. I'm just making this up as I go along. I'm but, thinking and- I'm thinking the portal at the end of season five of Buffy in The Gift, where that portal that's going to destroy the world is created. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, something along those lines. And and people are generally terrified of this thing. And, and, oh, my God, it could be fantastic. And it's just not. And, you know, with just a tweak. As I say, I'd love to do all the sets and make it look not so 80s. But if I could just redo the time lash inside and out and just have people a bit more scared of it, oh, man, that could really help. Yeah, if you're going to call the story time lash, that thing has to work. Yes. And if there's any money left over, we can do the bandrels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they have their own sort of a feel. Anyway, season 24, Dave, is my second one. So it takes us into the McCoy era. And this this is this is probably my second most reaching sort of one because mm. I can see how this story works, but would I like to do some things to it? Yeah, I think I would. And that story is Paradise Towers. Like I say, it's a story I almost wouldn't touch in some ways, but the sense of unreality around it you know, a, a lot of McCoy stories have this unreal sort of feeling to them. Think of, say, the Happiness Patrol. Yep. But the Happiness Patrol sort of falls on the right side of unreality. It, it, like, it feels very unreal, but I'm okay with it. This one feels very unreal, and I am oh, I just want to tweak it somehow. I want to tweak the cleaning robots. I want to tweak the look of it. Could it have been filmed in a real tower block? I, I know I talked about this on a recent episode, and I was kind of like, oh, that might make it too much like Dread. But there's just something about this story that I think is good and interesting and I think it's a fascinating place to set a story and, and with what's going on there, it's it's deserving of a bit more than how it looks. You know, would I, would I rough the Kangs up a bit as well? That's not really a special effect, but I might roughen them up as well, make them more like a scary sort of gang than just some, some girls from the local high school, you know, playing hooky. Uh Paradise Towers, Dave, does that do it for you? We've discussed before that I'm quite a fan of Paradise Towers. I think the script is very clever. There's some good actors in it. There's there's a couple of poor directoral choices. But you're right. Everything you say there would, would improve it and I think improve its reputation. I was just thinking, though, as you were talking, I can remember season 24 is around the time that I did join fandom as a very young boy. Hmm. And I can remember reading the local fanzies, fanzies at the time. They had many criticisms of the season. The stories, um, Bonnie, Sylvester. But there was this very real consensus that the special effects had really been turned up a notch this year. And the Rani's bubble trap and Kane's melting face were two that fans really pointed to and said, See? Doctor Who special effects can be really good. And the Tetrap costumes and the Ice World stuff. You know, fans were actually quite impressed by the special effects that year. And it, it's funny to look back now at some of those and go, we were impressed by that? Wow. Mm. <laughs> but, but yeah, no, I think, I think what you're saying is very fair. Yeah, I, I do see where they were coming from, though, with a few of those things. Like the, the, the bubble trap, I don't think had been seen before in Who. And the, the Kane's melting face was very sort of Raiders of the Lost Ark and so on. So I, I see why those things excited them. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyway. So we've done 10 from the classic series and, and you've had six of them. So I've got two left from the new series. Mm. The first of them, I'll just say it outright, is Evolution of the Daleks. Okay. Because this is an example of where I thought... Look, I don't think that Evil of the Daleks is a great story to start with. Let me say that. But... I can remember watching this and looking at some of the special effects across the whole of the two parts and just thinking they were so embarrassingly terrible that I was starting to laugh at the story, not enjoy the story or even really watch the story. The Dalek sort of opening up and trying to consume the bad guy. Then his <laughs> his mask with those things on his face. Um, the pig people. The stuff with the Doctor sort of trying to capture lightning on a tower. Like, some of these things were just laugh out loud, embarrassingly badly done. Clearly not through lack of money or through lack of know-how, but just what seemed like a good idea at the time on screen does not work. And yeah. I'm not saying that Evolution of the Daleks or Daleks in Manhattan would become fan favourites if you updated the special effects, but I think that a lot of the criticism they get, and I, I, I'm the first to criticise them, is because of the way they've done these special effects. And if you redid them with hindsight, 
you could actually make this much creepier and much more effective. Yeah, I mean, they're not certainly not among my favourite uh, episodes, but I think of elements of them, like the uh, the people living in the park, those scenes. Uh, do you know the bits I mean, where the yes. people are living in... Is it Central Park they must be living in? It is Central Park, like yes, yes. Yeah, and all those sort of scenes. I think that's really cool and historical, and I'm quite interested in that. But, yeah, the, the guy getting around in the suit with the Dalek face and all that sort of stuff, and even some of the accents and so on. I know that's not an effect, though. <laughs> but, oh, my God, Laszlo! Uh, and all that sort of stuff. Um, it's Yeah, yeah, you could take... Yeah, yeah, I'll just say yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I've said my piece there. <laughs> Very good. And the second one, we're only going two, three years ago with this one, is a story that is very much maligned. I've never really had a problem with it, but I do think it falls apart when you suddenly have a great big giant flying chicken bursting out of the moon. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, of course, Kill the Moon. I yes. quite like Kill the Moon. I like the setup. I like all that night filming in the special location i think it looks great i like the way that the choice is given to the earth i like the realistic way earth makes that choice i think there's some good stuff there but again when your big finale is a giant space monster and the giant space monster looks terrible looks cheap and again another point the interaction that it has where you just cannot believe that that came out of the moon and that's completely uh, dotted and highlighted and lampshaded and all the rest of it by the fact it then proceeds to magically lay another egg that is exactly the size of the one that it just came out of, it just falls apart. And if that's your big dramatic finale and it falls flat because it looks silly, that kind of spoils the episode for you. So I would like to see those last special effects of Kill the Moon redone and see if that enhances people's views. Because I do think underneath it, the first... 90 percent of it is actually pretty good yeah yeah it's a it's a problematic premise it's like the the writer had this idea and maybe even thought of the issues with it and then just couldn't let go of it and just you know pushed it through to a conclusion even though it doesn't make a lot of sense i don't know how it lays an egg bigger than itself like it, it, what, it, what are it, the it, physics there it, exactly so even if you read it and it laid a sort of soft squidgy egg that was you know over the course of a little bit of time expand it out you know in 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 some sort of way or look if we're actually going to go back and we're we're now talking script rather than effect but if it wasn't the earth's moon yeah yeah, well exactly of an alien planet for sure yeah even then i'd wonder what it's been living on inside the egg all this time i mean the food supply would be uh, finite uh, how long had it been sitting there and what had it been eating how was it alive I well if you're going to pick on all those things in Doctor Who you can write off 95% of the stories right? so, oh I know I know Dave and that's, and, that's part of the problem isn't and, it and, and, but, but again I think this is my point if that special effect made you go wow that's cool you wouldn't be asking those questions but if you look at the special effect and go hang on that doesn't work now you're out of the story and now you are going well hang on how did it get out of that thing and what was it living on and how did it lay an egg bigger than itself and why did that woman's face explode like you just <laughs> what, what, you know what's going on here i think that is a brilliant point that is an excellent point dave because yeah if if you go along with a story and you believe in it you you'll go along with some real bollocks at times you really really will but you enjoy it it's fun you might even realize it was bollocks but you're okay with it but when you are taken out as you say it it, it becomes problematic yeah and that's why i was sort of pleased that this ended up as being my last choice because i think it does highlight that problem that we're trying to discuss here which is the moment when the special effects get so bad that you just go i now know i'm watching a tv show and it's flawed oh look and i can see all the other flaws as well Mm. as opposed to i'm just enjoying this and look that looks cheesy but i so don't care Well, that brings us to the end, Dave. But I think for an epilogue, I would like to certainly talk about shows that fans might hate the effects in. Maybe we hate the effects in, but which didn't make our lists for certain reasons and why. Yeah, yeah. so shall I throw one off the bat or do you want to start? Well, look, I'll I'll start with an era because I thought, you know, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back to the start. I'm going to go back to Hartnell where people think, you know, possibly Doctor Who was that it's you know oldest and and ropiest and effects really weren't much chopped back in those days at all at least in the pertwee era where an effect looks crap at least they're using cso and things and you know having a real shot in the hartnell era it was very hard to do this sort of stuff 
And so I think of historicals like Marco Polo and the Aztecs, and I think I wouldn't change that at all, even though you could now redo them. Like Marco Polo, you could go on location and make it look like they're actually there. Mm. But I think there were some amazing practical sets in Marco Polo from what you see of the photography, like especially the colour photography. Yes. Like they were doing some amazing stuff there. And in the Aztecs, there are some very clever sets that give you this real sort of, they're trying to show a depth of field that there's stuff happening out there in the distance. And it's, it's, it's not, it's just painted on the wall in, in the studio. But I think that's brilliant, and and I wouldn't change that, even though you could change it and make it look like they were really there. I wouldn't do it. No, one that occurred to me that I think a lot of fans perhaps would nominate was The Invisible Enemy. Yes. And although none of the effects inside the Doctor's brain really work, I mean, they, they don't work, they still, to me, sell this idea of the great journey that he's on and what he's doing and and i think if you did try to make it realistic it it just wouldn't be quite as exciting or fun and it certainly captured my imagination when i saw it as a boy Mm -hmm. uh even even the the giant prawn i mean you know you say okay let's redo that well what 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 else would you do yeah Uh, you know what 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 does a giant virus look like yeah uh, so I, I I was very relaxed about that one. I I consider that, and I didn't have it on my, off on my list. I, I, I'm happy with it as it is. Yeah, I'll chuck out another couple from the Hartnell era, uh, the first being Dalek Invasion of Earth. This, to me, just feels right. I think the location filming is great, and when, say, the, the Dalek Saucer comes in, yeah, you could redo the Dalek Saucer. In, th- in fact, I think they might have even redid the Dalek Saucer on the DVD. They did, they did. Um, yeah, but I don't think that needs redoing. I think it just feels right. It's a it's a great 60s story. Leave it as it is. I'll be never watching it with the, uh, the uh, redone Saucer. And the second one is the Celestial Toymaker, because... You could make that world of the Celestial Toymaker feel really bizarre and oh, weird and, you know, do all sorts of things. But to me, it's got that studio-bound weird Avengers vibe to it. Mm. I know it's not like an episode of the Avengers, but do you know what I mean by I, Avengers I do, I do. vibe? And, and it actually does at times feel like an episode of the Avengers. I think, I think you can say that. Okay. Well, yeah, okay. Yeah, in some ways, perhaps so. Uh, and so I wouldn't change it for the world, even though you could redo it in a different way. It's really interesting that you say that because I did actually come very, very close to putting the Celestial Toymaker on my list. Yeah. I do think that if the special effects were better, this would have a bit more love from fans. But then I thought, no, I, I actually don't need that, and I don't want that, and I'm, I'm not putting it on my list. Mm, okay. Do you have any more? Uh, the other one I was going to mention is Dragonfire. Okay. Where, again, the sets do look like plastic. The dragon costume, it's not bad for what they were doing in 1987, but it could look a lot better. But I think there's a, there's a lovely charm to it all. I think it works. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of relaxed with it. If you said to me they're going to remake Dragonfire with a CGI dragon and fix up a bit of the sets and make it a bit more ice-like, a bit more realistic, look, I'd be very interested in that and I'd probably enjoy it and I think it would be kind of cool, but I don't need it. Mm-hmm. Okay. To round out, I've got a couple from the modern era. Obviously, I didn't pick any I'd like to change from the modern era, but here's a couple that I was thinking about, but no, I wouldn't change. One is the Lazarus experiment. Oh, okay. Now, when you look at that big monster that Mark Gatiss turns into... Yes. It it could be done so much better today, even on a Doctor Who budget. It could look ten times better. Yes. But I think back to when I first saw that episode and I thought, oh, my God, this looks so sickening and and creepy. And and it was actually quite scary when it was chasing the Doctor around and and into that church and, and stuff. And I had such a feel about it. I was like... No, I wouldn't actually change that. I think it's okay. I think that can stay as it is. I, I don't think it would really add to the story. I feel I feel creeped out and weirded out and scared by that when it's chasing the Doctor and Martha, as it is. Yeah. Of all my problems with the Lazarus experiment, that special effect was way down the list. <laughs> yeah, you had some other issues. Okay. I, uh, yeah, I, I just think it fundamentally doesn't work as a story and the performances are all over the place and... By by the time you get to the sort of the giant comedy scorpion, I was I was already out of the story. I'm afraid. Uh, fair enough. The second one I was thinking about was the Curse of the Black Spot. 
Ah, interesting. I thought for a modern story, this just feels so cheap and nasty, especially where they're on that ship and there's just like strips of plastic hanging from the ceiling. It's like something, I hate to say this, it's like something out of the Davo era. Mm. And yet it's modern Doctor Who with Matt Smith and there's there's plastic strips hanging from the ceiling. Like, what the hell? You know, that, that whole set could have looked a, a lot better. The effect of the, the siren on the ship was quite good the effect they put on that uh, actress to make her look all spooky and and ghost-like that was that was quite good but even the ship that they're on i'd I'd like to feel that that's at sea and there's movement and maybe weather conditions and you know i'd I'd just like i'd just like it to feel a bit more real curse the black spot just feels really budget and really oh i don't know what i'm trying to say uh, but would i change it no (laughs) You know, it it does have this sort of charm. It it does have these issues, but it does have this this charm. And I'd I'd leave it, but it's borderline for me. It's probably the closest I got to putting New Who in the list. If I ask myself the question, do the effects tell me the story the script writer wants to tell? I have to say, yes, they do. Could they be better? Certainly for the standard of what's around them. Absolutely. I've said before on the podcast, I'll say it again, when the tell-all book about the Moffat era is written... I'm going to be fascinated to know what happened with some of these budget fights and, and where clearly things have got a lot tighter than Moffat expected them to be. There, there was clearly stuff going on with the budget behind the scenes that we still don't know about. And I mm. think The Curse of the Black Spot is right in the middle of that. But mm. does it do a good enough job at telling me the story? Yes, it does. Yeah, look, and, and I think so too. On balance, it does. Yeah. You know, the, Just. the line for okay. me. Okay, I can get that. Hmm. Anyway, that's our discussion. You you came up with this topic, Dave. Do you think we've done it justice? I think we've explored it in ways that I perhaps hadn't expected, and we've come up with some stories that I certainly didn't expect. So, uh, yes, I, I think you can talk about how to improve a story without kicking a story. And actually, what I think we've done in some cases is, whilst highlighting a bad special effect, actually highlighting good script and story and performances around that that perhaps mm. deserved more attention. Yeah, absolutely.